And so I can't, I don't have that algebraic equation. It's not as easy as throwing it into MATLAB, F min con, and saying go, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not the simple cardboard box with the top removed and the cost on the side of the box. Anyways, um, and then you say, well, Eric, but we know all the combining all these objective functions, there's some that I want to maximize and there's some that I want to minimize. What do I do then? Right? So there's all these little variants that if you actually go and try to do what I told you, it gets a little more complicated. Let's get down to the practical kind of stuff, right? And then you say, well, Eric, you just told me, you just told me about all those wonderful computers that can make all these calculations for me, right? And how do I integrate that into my solution, right? How do I combine all this stuff? <coughs> so I say, okay. Um, you use this thing, it's called a goodness function. I needed a goodness function because I came up with my particular S curve. Um, but anyways, there's these other S curves that exist, and, and so you can go read in the theory, right? But this one's mine. I'll take it uh, until somebody tells me it's not mine. Uh, <laughs> so I'll take credit for it now. Um, there's always trade-offs, cost versus performance, mass versus speed versus accuracy. And when you get there, like, how do you decide what the best solution is? You have all of these solutions. How do you pick the best solution from all of these? What, because the best for Dr. Sineski, instead, is different than the best for Dr. Hobbs, right? This isn't then the Merrim's best, right? They're all different bets. So when we all have different inputs into this custom product, how do we decide what's best? Um, and, and yeah, it can be expensive if if you're having humans make all these decisions. So you need something called a goodness function. And the goodness function is very simple, right? There's an unacceptable threshold and an acceptable threshold. If your goodness is below an unacceptable threshold, it's guess what? Unacceptable. <laughs> And if it's above the acceptable threshold, then it's acceptable. And in the middle, there's a trade-off, right? And, and you can say, oh, this, well, what's an example of this? Megapixels on a camera for an iPhone, right? I'm not buying a freaking phone that doesn't have at least five megapixel resolution, right? It's just not good for me. So my unacceptable threshold is five megapixels. And then you go, well, but also, uh, you know, I, I don't need anything more than 12. 12 megapixels are fine. I would like HD video recording, by the way, which is not on my iPhone 4 right now, but maybe on the iPhone 5, or my, when I get my iPad, I'll be happy, right? So that's over here, right? Now, okay, so that's great, but you say, oh, there's this other thing called the badness function, it's just the inverse of the goodness function, really. Um, but the cost I'm willing to pay, uh, I have an unacceptable threshold here, right, of 500 bucks, right? I'm gonna pay more than 500 bucks for my next phone, right? Uh, and if it gets less than uh, if it gets less than 300 bucks, whatever, I'm used to paying that for these phones anyway, so I'm gonna just dole it out, right? I know it's different when you're a graduate student. It's like 10 bucks, <laughs> dollar lunch, right? Dollar beers, but no, no, no. Uh, so, anyways, um, these are these functions, right? And the cool thing is that they're they're kind of in line with the human decision making process, right? You know, and like negotiation over multiple things. When we go negotiate things, right? There are limits that we have. <coughs> And if the guy's not going to give me a car for a certain amount, right, I'm not, I'm not going to buy it. Forget it. I'm out of here. I'll just walk away. Now, if he's in the middle, I'm going to negotiate with him a little bit. So you have these competing things going on, right, the options that you want on the car and the cost and all these things. You're making trade-offs, right? You're dealing. And certain things are more important to people than other things, for example. So uh, I put this together because a lot of people, don't, they, they get a little confused about goodness. Why should I care about it? Right? I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story of drilled holes in a, in a metal plate. Okay? Drilled holes in a metal plate. You say, okay, I called the machine shop and I said, Harold, he's the manager of the machine shop, Harold, how close can I put my hole to the edge of the car? Right? He says, half millimeter, Eric, that's all I can do. Half millimeter? Right? You're a precision machine shop. Right? You need half millimeter? Right? 20 mils. What's going on? Right? Or some big number. Right? It, and they say, okay, uh, we can do 250 microns, or 0.25 millimeters. Okay, great. So being the diligent guy that I am, I happily go right my inequality constraint down, and I say, okay, the wall thickness, right? The wall thickness has to be less than 250 microns, or 0.25, right? So I, you know, whatever. You guys are doing this with me, right? So you say, being the, being the diligent students, we already go off and do our work, and we come up with this inequality constraint. And we go run our, our program, and sure enough, everything looks great. And then we run the really aggressive one, and it goes to minimum wall thickness. So we're like, yeah, it's slam dunk, right? Give me another problem, right? And I'll solve that one too. So you're feeling good, except for two months later, you get a phone call from the machine shop saying, 
what the heck's going on, right? Why are these holes over here? I'm yielding them at 50% now. They're all at the minimum. They're all showing up at the minimum now. What's going on? Right? So you say, huh, right? And your manager shows up, and he says, Eric, or Dr. Sineski, or, or you, or any of you, right? And he says, he says, what the heck are you doing with that program? You're killing me here. The shop is yielding 50%, right? The production line slowed down. We didn't buy enough material to support yields at 50%. What if we got customer commitments to deliver to, right? What's going on? So you say, okay, I got it. I got it. I'm going to go change my inequality constraint. Now it's at 0.38 millimeters. I'm going to give it a little buffer, right? It's a pretty common, actually, this happens, right? And, and so uh, things are on fine, fine again. And then the marketing guy calls you and says, we just rejected all these designs. Why can't we do them? We did all these other designs earlier. These designs that we're rejecting now, they're easier than the old ones. Right? And that's when you're going to remember this talk. It will come. It will come in your work. Right? You'll be like, ah, I should have used the goodness function. So if we would have used the goodness function, you would have put our unacceptable threshold here, an acceptable threshold here. Anything above a half millimeter, the machine shop doesn't care. And not anywhere near it. Right? Whatever, they're going to drill their hole, it's fine. You get close to the edge, you've got a problem. And so what's cool is you can take those inequality constraints that you have, right? And you can turn those inequality constraints into objective functions and put them in your aggregate objective function. So they now become part of your optimization. And this is a standard thing, it's called a penalty function approach. It's, it, it's nothing new, right? So if you want the more classical name for these things, penalty functions, and you throw penalty functions into your objective function, you optimize that, uh, minimizing constraints. Um, but what does it really look like? It really looks like this. So the, the goodness function really looks like this. And let me e explain a couple really important things about goodness functions. The first thing is it's normalized. And you say, well, Eric, why is that really important? Well, a value, a value that's normalized between 0 and 1, it's easy for me to compare a lot of things between 0 and 1, right? To say, what is it percent, or what, what is its relative value between? Um, the second is it's non-dimensional. So this whole mass versus stiffness thing, it's not a big deal, right? It, it doesn't even, now this whole this relationship takes, is taken care of. Um, so it's non-dimensional and normalized, so it's easy for me to compare. It's smooth and continuous. Uh, well, why should I care, actually, if it's smooth and continuous? Well, your computer likes to differentiate things that's, that are smooth and continuous, right? So when you're running optimization functions, there's all these steep descents and, and crazy things that you're going to do, and you have this, this nice curvature. Uh, the fourth thing is it's asymptotic. Why is asymptotic important? Well, once I get above my acceptable threshold, what you don't want your objective, what you don't want to have happen, is if something is really, really good, right? And you're let's let's say you use the line. You didn't use this asymptotic. You just use the line. If it's really, really good, it's overpowering all other objective functions, right? But you don't care that that one's really, really good. It's above a threshold. Just take it and go, right? It's good enough. We always hear about it. It's good enough. Let's go, right? Let's make product. Um, it's customer focused. You get to say, I like this many uh, kilonewtons per meter. Uh, I want this many kilograms max, right? You get to say the things, how you're thinking about the design rather than uh, inputting some other strange numbers, right? Of, of limits on things and equality constraints. It sometimes gets silly. Um, and it can be defined for any objective function. It's pretty simple. And the math looks like this. <gasps> it's craziness, right? But it's really easy. Um, the only thing you need to provide is this information and this one. And I'll show you what I do is I leave this at point 0.1. Leave it at point 0.1. Uh, that means 90% is acceptable and 10% is not acceptable. Things below 10% are not acceptable and things above 10%. You can put that number wherever you want between 0 and 0.5-ish. Uh, I think I have to go back and look. Um, but you, but. Once given these things and this thing, this stuff is all calculated. So it, if you can type it into Excel, you're golden. Oh wait, I typed it into Excel for you. And we'll be providing the Excel sheet at the end of the class on my, it'll be online. Um, so then your linear aggregate objective function, which before was just functions, look, it looks the same actually, but it's got a goodness of an objective function. Right, so you still have your same multiplier, but before it was just at the you're saying, what's the goodness of that function? What's the goodness of that stiffness? What's the goodness of that cost? What's the goodness of that mass? Right? So now you're just evaluating all these different goodnesses together. And since everything's always nonlinear, it's very often that these, pro that these optimization uh, things that you come up with are highly nonlinear. 
well, that's okay. The, all the optimization codes can handle these nonlinear things these days. So you just throw it all in there. And what the hell, if they can't, you can just calculate the entire design space, actually, because you can make calculate, you can do these calculations very fast. Um, so anyways, that's, that's kind of how the math looks like. Um, it's great, it's also great for evaluating fitness. One of the things that, I tried to look through the genetic algorithm lecture, but one of the things that is always the pragmatic aspects of running, uh, running these genetic algorithms is that you have to be able to describe what's good, right? But now you have a goodness function, and you have an aggregated goodness function. So you can look at each of your solutions in your space and say, how good is it with respect to what you want to know, right? So you go through the different nodes, and these parents have children, and you're evaluating if they're good or not, and you're saying, hey, this one's really good. I want to swap it with this really good one. I'm going to marry the good ones together. Let's see what happens then, right? Then we'll have a great one, uh, and they'll have great children. And so, uh, goodness functions are really good for, for evaluating goodness, um, independent of whether you're using them for optimization, uh, like I am here. Um, you don't need to algebraically describe functions, you just need to be able to test for the, for the values, right? So you can go anywhere, right? For example, find an element analysis. You run an FEA, you make a geometry, a custom geometry, you run the FEA, automate in an automated fashion, a number pops out. But you do that a bunch of times and just throw all those numbers into a table, I'll show you how easy it is. And then you can do some polynomial fits if you like, or you can just select the best one from all the ones that you made. Um, and the value will be between zero and one. So here's the recipe. I told you I'd give it to you. First I told you that we're gonna get rid of your jobs, and then, <laughs> then I told you I'd tell you how to do it. Right? So now there comes the enablement part. A lot of this, right now, the talk has been up to, uh, up to you know, why we should go do stuff. But here, here, here it is, right? We kind of talked about it. We define the customer needs and the customer product in the product architecture with a parametric geometry with a design for n variables, right? So we say, okay, we're gonna go make a design with this many variables, right? So we've got some three variables to play with. Uh, we go and generate a design space, right? We gotta go run some cases. We gotta go run some perturbations to see and make, some, make a population for us to study. Uh, so we make a population of things to study. Uh, we calculate the performance result at each node using goodness functions. So we find out how good is it. Um, then what I like to do, you don't have to do this, I say if necessary, because if you run enough cases, you can just select the best one, right? You can just select the best case. We'll go through this. Um, but I like to kind of sometimes run interpolation functions too to find out if there was, is there something between the nodes that I, that I made is there something between that's better? Maybe there's something better. I don't even know it. That would be terrible. Wow. You know, running an interpolation function is a really cheap thing to do. I can do that really fast on my computer. Um, so then, then, you know, all this stuff up here is all code. And so per custom design, we're going to import these goodnesses, the acceptable and unacceptable thresholds for each of the performance parameters. And you're going to optimize goodness using your interpolation functions. So you're just going to pick what the best is. Uh, and then you're going to check the result for improvement. I have to check the result for improvement because I've interpolated, right? I've interpolated between nodes. So if I don't go back and check, I'm not doing my due diligence, right? That's a bad idea. You should always, optimization codes are very silly things. You should always go back and do a sanity check. And the computer can do a sanity check for you, right? Is the optimized design better than any of the other solutions that I got that were acceptable, right? If it's not, something's wrong. You should go find out what's going on in your code. Um, so we're back to our prod project today. Everybody understands we're going to go make this custom thing. But let's get, um, let's get really practical about uh, and have an example of this thing. So, you know, we go to find the customer need. It's got to fit my face. It's got to fit my face. And you're like, well, Eric, how are you going to decide whether it fits your face and peripheral visions are all right? Well, I'll just sit in front of my webcam and move my head around like this. And this is so cool. That's my face.com. It reconstructs a three-dimensional image of your face with two pictures. It's so dope. So you get, and you can actually, what they do is they'll make, uh, they'll make uh, figures for you, uh, little action figures, with your face on it in 3D. It's so cool. It's so cool, right? I'm going to go make one now. I, I didn't know how to, how to ship to all my friends, right? It's, it's going to be rad. So I can make glasses that fit your face now. Those adjustable ear things with the hinges and stuff, forget about it. Forget it. That's silly, right? That's added complexity that we don't need, right? All these movable parts. It's all crap, and you know, look at move, movable things on cell phones, right? I love my iPhone because it's clean and nothing moves, right? Those hinges, they get nasty, like skin stuff in them, and kind of greasy, and 
Is it nasty, right? So let's 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 just make everything stack. Um, I want dual cameras. I want dual cameras so I can recreate um, three-dimensional images. Like, I want to see. I want to take video of my kids playing in 3D, right? And I want to be able to recreate that for myself in the future, right? I want this thing always to be running. To be like, oh, Hayden just did a really cool thing, right? Record. Make sure you log that, right? Or Nixon just walked for the first time, and I saw it, right? So log. So again, technology. The, the, the nature of the game is technology integrated into our world. Um, I want everything in a heads-up display, right? I want to see everything in front of me. I want to, I want to be able to create a really dope world that I live in, and it's in these glasses, and I can just kick it. Um, uh, I want to have a good battery life, which for me means between 12 and 13 <coughs> hours when I'm traveling, right? My iPhone sucks, right? The thing runs out of juice if I'm watching a movie on an airplane, right? In no time flat, and then I can't plug in on, on certain airlines. So I'm stuck with a dead iPhone, and then my you know, if my computer runs out too. So I want a good battery life, um, sufficient memory. 64 gigabytes is good enough for me. I'll be happy with it. I, you know, I could fill up my iPhone at 32 gigs, but right now I take 60. I would like 64. 32 is good enough. 64 is. I, beyond that, I'm not going to really use it. I don't think. Um, low mass on my nose, right? When you wear glasses, like if it gets heavy on your nose, it's a real pain in the butt, right? The ears, it's, it's easier to ha have, but they figured that out with the straight stuff so it doesn't hurt my ears anymore, right? So this whole weight on the nose thing is gonna bother me too much, and so I gotta have this. Everybody, everybody get it? I, all I said is what I want. That's what I want. Okay, now we're gonna give parameters, because remember that all the technology exists at this today, nobody's put it together, so whether Apple or Google or whoever goes and does it, right? Uh, they, gotta go, they gotta go make it happen for me. And it's gotta be custom, because it's gotta be for me. I, I want the blue lenses. Uh, and I want the blue thing over here because I think that's cool and it matches with the camera, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to let three variables be free: the thickness of the arm, the height of the arm, and the, and the lens. The length of the, the length isn't that important, right? Because it just goes straight back. So whatever. We'll have these three free variables, and we're going to go meet my needs now. How the heck are we going to do that? So what I do is you generate a design space, and here I'm going to generate just a linear design space for this example. Right? You want to go parabolic, cubic, right? You want to fill the whole thing with very small increments and just calculate them all? Go ahead. Right? I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you whether you should do that or not, but I'm just going to do a linear one. Uh, partially because I was up until 4 a.m. the other night doing this thing. I was like, we don't need 27 points here. We just need 8. Um, so you guys understand that this is just a design space. Right? I've got the height of the arm, which goes from 1.2 to 26. Right? So, really thin to about a little bit over an inch. Uh, 1.5 to 12, right, so thin to a half an inch. That's the, the thickness of the lens up front. I'm gonna go throw some batteries and some electronics in there. Uh, and then uh, one and a half to nine for the thickness of the arm, that's, the, that's over here, right? And I'm gonna put this all in rapid prototyping so we can go print this stuff out, right? Because remember the geometry, the overall width and some of the peripheral stuff, it's gotta, it's gotta fit you, but the overall thickness is, I'm gonna define with these three free parameters. Um, calculate the performance at each node. Okay, got it. So I went and did that, right? I went and did that for you. Um, it was it was really fun. <laughs> um, and so here you go. There's eight cases where you know the first four it has t is equal to 1.5. So this is just a two to the n kind of a thing, right? N is three, two to the three is eight. There's eight cases that define all of the points on that side of the cube, right? And then you get these performance metrics. Then I go run interpolation functions on these things, so I calculate what the coefficients are at, at each one, right? Now, in this particular example, I want to tell you, I did do all 27 calculations, and I did prove that uh, I was less than 5% error on my interpolation functions over that range, right? So I did know that it was okay for me to do linear stuff. Don't go do something that's linear if it's not, not linear relationships, guys, right? Just because... You say, well, Eric told me to do linear interpolation. No, you have to go understand what the, what the space is, what your allowable space is. Okay? So, so I did that. Um, so the calculations are made, um, you know, these custom geometries, you know, I have to go make these calculations using three-dimensional tools, right? I have to go look at volumes and thicknesses and these things for mass, where the center of gravity is. But all that is easily calculated in SOLIDWORKS. I just click a button, okay? FEA, right? Done in SolidWorks or Cosmos, right? Or you can export it somewhere else and you click a button and it's done, right? But 
But, um, you know, so I have discrete points, and because I don't have an algebraic function that I can go differentiate and plug into MATLAB at the con, I just have this type of data that I, I make these approximations. Um, then I go ahead and I import the goodness data, so these are the same goodnesses that I told you earlier, right? Uh, 2, 10, and 2, 64, and 32 gigs, and, and 36 and 12 hours. Um, I define the weights. For me, the mass was just the most important weight, right? The mass, and, and it was just, I just couldn't, it was just, the weight on the nose really bothered me. It's the most, you might be different, maybe it's memory, man. If I don't have 100 gigs, it's 90%, right? And whatever, and by the way, you don't have to use like percentages, like these things don't have to add up to 100 for you to be successful, because we divided by the sum of the weights earlier, right? So you're like, well, there it can all add up to 100, but it doesn't have to, right? I can go type a 10 or a 1,000 or whatever I want in this particular area, and things will work out. Um, and then uh, there's limits on the variables, what the variables could be. Right? I can't have a height of the glasses being like a meter. That's not acceptable, right? It's not going to fit on my head. Right? It would be kind of, kind of cool, but it might be cool. And then, you know, what? I, all I did is I just, I just go to the solver, right? And I click on this cell, and I say solve, maximize. And I, of course, I go click on all the constraints, and, it's, and it just solves, it comes out, right? The mass, it's it goes, it maxes out the mass, right? For this particular example, it's like 10 grams. I, I, I can't do less uh, than 10 grams if you want me to optimize these other trade-offs. So you can go play around with you can go play around with the limits on the on what's acceptable, the unacceptable thresholds and acceptable thresholds, and then you can figure it out. But but they all pass, right? They're all 0.1 or greater. So uh, my total goodness is 0.15. So sweet, I got a solution, right? Uh, I don't need remember. I don't need 100% for my total goodness. I don't need 90% for my total goodness. When I make products, I make them good enough for the people to use them, or good enough to meet the requirements that they set forth, right? I don't need to give them an optimal solution all the time, right? And sometimes the optimal solution, as Professor Agajima was talking about this morning, sometimes the optimal solution isn't actually the best solution. It's not robust. It's got huge sensitivities. Things change as a function of time, right? So, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be careful with with those things. Now, I'm, I don't go do a sensitivity analysis or any of that here, but it's easy to bake that into your calculation. You have all the data you need. Check goodness. This is kind of an eye chart, meaning you can't read it. Um, but what it does, it says down here, I'm going to tell you this, it says, the goodness is 0.2. And you say, wait a second, Eric, there was 0.15 on the previous one. What the heck happened? Well, actually, you'll come check over here, and it's the goodness for the mass is 0.06. It's not acceptable. It's below that 0.1 that we talked about. Right? It's not acceptable to the user because the overall mass for this one is 11 grams. And I said explicitly, no more than 10. Right? In my inputs, when I typed them into the computer, I said no more than 10. Um, so we did our sanity check for worksheets here, right? and this is what the glasses look like. They're 6 millimeters thick. I actually checked mine. Uh, I have some really cool sunglasses that I like. They're not Oakley's. Um, but uh, I have a set of Oakley's too. But I checked my glasses. They were on the order of 5 here. Um, this was on the order of, uh, of 12, 13 here, but they're like the running ones, the kind of silly ones. And the thickness was 1.2 millimeters. So it makes sense. It kind of kind of made sense to me. Um, how am I going to manufacture this thing? Well, I'll, just, I'll go throw this into um, some rapid prototyping uh, stuff, and I'll ship it to you using FedEx. So, um, so the thing is, right, to do this custom design, which what, what you should be realizing is, we did that entire exercise without a human going to a CAD machine, right? Without a human going to a finite element box, right? Uh, without a human making stiffness calculations, or, uh, you know, is it going to break, or the accelerations when you drop it, or any of these things, right? We didn't have to do that. Um, we didn't have to do it. And so that diligence, that, that, what, did that, what did that require that we do? What it required that we did is, is it required that we look at um, the algorithms of the decisions that we make when we design things, right? If you're going to go invent products, which is what a lot of you probably want to do, or well, even if you don't, you should talk to your guys who are inventing products, right? They should not only be thinking about that new cool thing that they made, right? But what was the algorithmic approach, the stepwise process that they, that they used to, to design said thing, right? And when you write that down, you, you have the diligence to do the documentation. Now, that's a very 